he goes to visit Mary in Nazareth. Luke 1.26. And in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So there's, there's a lot here, just little pieces that kind of help us. How many of you guys understand that we view the Bible, no matter how hard we try, we view the Bible with a Western mindset? But the Bible was not written at all with a Western mindset. It was written with an Eastern mindset. And so we need to understand some of the things that were going on here. So first of all, Nazareth. And so if you've been to Nazareth ever with us, um, you would know that it's, it's a really large Arab city now. Um, it's predominantly Muslim, but it's, one, it's the largest Arab city in Israel. Um, but back then, it wasn't. There were about 400 residents of Nazareth. It was not notable by any means. In fact, the only notable thing biblically that ever happened in Nazareth is that Gabriel came to visit Mary there and that Jesus was raised in this small town. So this small town, it's outside of this, this really big city called Sephoris, but it's a small town, and, and Jesus, this is where Jesus grew up. So Jesus grew up in a really small town. And, and actually, if you go to Nazareth, they built a big church, the uh, biggest church in the Middle East. They built it right over uh, Mary's house. So where Mary was as a young, probably 14 to 16-year-old Jewish girl, the angel Gabriel showed up there and, and declares to her, hey, you're going to have the son who's going to be the Messiah of Israel. So let's keep reading. Verse 28. Then the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. We need to take note, and we're going to come back to it often today, that she was highly favored, but and that the Lord is with her. And both these things are important. That she's highly favored, and the Lord is with her. And I, and I want to keep kind of harping on a few things. This is a young Jewish girl, so not of a nation that's ruling and reigning or powerful or, or by any means, that lives in one of the smallest towns in all of Israel. So you could, you could maybe say she's unimportant. You know, out of, out of all the people that God could have chosen in all the world, He picks a young Jewish girl in a really small town to have His son, right? And I, and I, I like to think, when we start to think about it, because we realize a lot of times God can't see us and God doesn't know what's going on in our life. And maybe we feel like He's uninvolved, but God sees everything. And no one is unimportant to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Verse 29. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words. It doesn't say that she had a lack of faith like Zechariah we read last week. But Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. So he says it twice. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David, and He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So we're going to stop there for a moment and just try to, if we can, get in, in Mary's mind and heart and what she's experiencing. So again, um, she's probably 14 to 16 years old. Any 14 to 16 year old girls in here? Okay. She's 14 to 16 years old. The angel Gabriel, who is a, I believe from what Scripture teaches, is like a frightening creature. Like when Zacharias saw him, right, he's frightened by, I mean, this is a powerful angel that stands in the presence of God, shows up and, and, and tells her that, hey, even though you're a virgin, you're going to have the Son of the Most High. And so she's troubled by this, right, and she asks him how it can be, and he just says God's going to do this. So just back up a minute. We read this story, we're thinking about, man, it's exciting, Jesus is going to be born, but what about Mary? What's she dealing with? What is going to, what, what's going to happen to her? And so she's betrothed to this guy named Joseph. What that means is that, and we need to understand an, an Eastern view of marriage. So there are three stages to marriage. First of all, it was this. The f two fathers would get together. You have the father of the son and the father of the daughter. The father of the groom and the father of the bride. And they would get together and they would plan a marriage. And because the father of the bride, the father of the girl, would be losing his daughter, he would get paid by the, the, the father of the son a price in order that he would give his daughter away. That's the first stage. <laughs> Excuse me. And I want you to think about just a minute the picture of God giving away and paying a, a high price 
that he may provide a bride for his son, right? So that's the first stage of marriage. The second stage of marriage is like the wedding ceremony. So they, they get married, they have this big ceremony, and they're betrothed to one another. And legally, at this point, they're married, even though they don't consummate the marriage. And even though the son leaves, and he goes back to his father's house to prepare a room. He wants to add on to his father's house and prepare a room that he may go back later, the third stage, and get his bride and take her to his father's house. And So I've got to stop when we say to just read John 14.1. This is Jesus speaking to us. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, he has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Say, a place for me. Jesus and I've gone. I, I, my, my Father's paid a great price that you would be my bride. And I'm not coming to get you yet. We're betrothed to Jesus at this point. And he's going to come back one day and he's going to gather his bride and he's going to take her to his father's house. Amen? So this was a, for him to say this story, we've got to understand the Eastern mindset of marriage. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I mean, he's, he's not a bad groom, right? I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am and you know the way to the place where I am going. So this is what Mary's dealing with. She's in stage two. They've had the wedding, wedding ceremony. They're basically, for all practical purposes, married, except for this, the, Joseph has left to go build on a room. He'll come back, get her later. They'll have another celebration, and he'll take her, and they'll consummate the marriage. So uh, let's go back to Mary's mindset for just a minute. She's sitting there. This angel shows up. And even though she's, a, I believe, a very godly young woman, all of a sudden she's got to start dealing with the repercussions of the favor of God on her life. The repercussions are, first of all, I may get stoned. Because legally, Joseph could have her stoned at this point. They're, they're married. She's committed adultery if he doesn't believe her. And praise God for Joseph. All he gets was a dream. He doesn't get Gabriel. He just decides. I mean, he just gets a dream, and he believes it. I mean, I wonder about some dreams I have sometimes. He gets a dream, believes the Lord, and moves on it. I may get stoned. I may be an outcast. Maybe, maybe no one, I mean, who's going to believe me? Hey, the angel Gabriel showed up and just told me that, that the Spirit of God is going to come upon me and I'm going to have the Son, the Messiah, the, the one that everyone's waiting for. And he's going to be born from me, a virgin, someone who's, who's never, who hasn't been with Joseph yet or been with any other man. Who's going to believe that? She's got to start thinking about how, how, is this, how is this going to affect her life in every single aspect. And as I was reading this, this is really kind of one of the things I want to get to this morning is this. is We, we don't understand the favor of God. In fact, we usually judge favor with man and call it favor of God. In other words, life isn't going right and all of a sudden we wonder, why is, why is, what's wrong with me and God? What's happening? Things aren't coming together as I thought they would. And Christianity is supposed to be easy. That's one big lie, right? Christianity is supposed to be easy. And if everything isn't going right, I'll never forget someone told me one time, you'll know when you're following the Lord when God starts sending more and more money to your church. I mean, dead point told me, I'll, praise God, I ain't a, come on Jesus, let's do it. I mean, it's, it's all right with me, but... I mean, that, that would be the determining factor. But this is what we do. Is anyone in here like, your car breaks down, you're like, man, what did I do? God, like, why is it? We start judging favor with God based on circumstances in our world. And if Mary would have done this, she, wouldn't have, she would have said, no, Lord. See, we don't, we don't get that favor with God sometimes means it's going to be a little hard. Favor with God is not the same as favor with man. Or favor with God is not the same as favor in this world. And we've got to learn to differentiate and understand that our relationship with God, His favor upon us is for He loves us, but for His purposes, it's not always going to be easy. When the angel looked at her and said, man, God is, you are highly favored, and God is going to be with you, which I think is the huge part of favor. You're favored, which means life might be a little tough, but God is going to be with you. God's going to stay with you, even though it's a little rough. Mary knew that her pregnancy, while bringing joy to the world, could have the opposite effect on her life. What was she thinking about? What was she going through? She would be ostracized. At best, 
Without God moving on Joseph's life, she's going to be a single mom, which in Jewish society is about as bad as it gets. In light of all these very real possibilities, she could have said, thanks, but no thanks, Lord. I didn't ask for this favor. It's more than I can deal with. My family, my friends will renounce me. Lord, don't I have the right to choose how my life goes? Which I think is real interesting that God chose this because of His favor and love for her without asking her, what does she think about it? It sounds strange, but sometimes finding favor with God makes life tough. I'm not talking about the disfavor we bring upon ourselves from sin or unrighteousness. But understanding that I, I, think, I think the church needs to get, and I, and I really think, I think it's a Western church issue predominantly, the Western church needs to get that the grace and favor of God in our life doesn't equal always abundance and ease in life. We only have to look at the apostles and other disciples in Scripture and throughout history to understand it. And the, really, the reason I, I want to say this today more than any other reason is for us to stop doing those things that we do, like the car broke down, the washing machine broke down, these kind of things happen. Now all of a sudden, I, there's no favor in my life. What's wrong? Why is God upset with me? Where are we at? What verse? Thirty-six. Okay. Even Elizabeth, as the angel still is talking, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. I love verse thirty-seven. For no word from God will ever fail. That's a pretty good verse, isn't it? No word from God will ever fail. No word from God over your life will ever fail. Just like with Elizabeth. God says, man, it's done. I, I, you're in your old age. You're going to have the Son who's going to usher in the Messiah. And just like my word over you, Mary, no word of God will ever fail. He, he, he's not in the business of failing us. Verse 38, Mary's response. I am the Lord's servant. Man, I love that. It's not... You know, the reason she says that is because she gets that the angel was saying something to her that wasn't easy. We think, oh, how, how amazing it must be. This isn't an easy thing. She doesn't say, man, praise God, I'm, I'm highly favored. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. You, Mary at this point, surrendered her will for her life to God. This was not her will for her life. I mean, if you look at not only what the, the possibilities of what she would endure, let's look at not just the possibilities, what she did endure. Having to run, having to hide, having to leave her family, having to, to go to Egypt, having to return, have to fear for, for, for Jesus' life, have to watch Jesus eventually be crucified in, in front of her. This wasn't an easy life, but she says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word over me be fulfilled. I believe that she considered favor with God a blessing instead of a burden. And she considered His favor more important than the world's. She considered God's favor over life a bigger deal than finding favor with man. She, she placed her complete trust in the Father who was able to shelter her, feed her, deliver her, comfort her. Mary was the perfect girl at the perfect time. She was a young little girl in a little bitty town that no one thought anything about. So up to the moment Gabriel shows up, what's going on in history is this. And so we, we have, like, at the end of our Old Testament, Malachi, right? So God had been speaking to prophets, and then for 400 years, he's silent until Gabriel shows up. So if we look at the Bible, I mean, you know, book after book of the Old Testament, 
God is showing up, speaking through a prophet. He's moving. He's doing something. And then for 400 years, God is silent. And when God's silent in our lives, it looks like He's not doing anything. We have got to understand, even when it seems like God is silent, He's always moving. So let me tell you why this was the perfect, she was the perfect girl, but let me tell you why this was the perfect time. It may seem like a bad thing that the Roman Empire was in charge, but there were so many things, we could just hit a few, there are so many things about the Roman Empire that made it the right time. First of all, one of the, one of the biggest things that the Romans did is they built this amazing superhighway system all over the, the known world. And Israel was positioned as, this, as the heart of this highway system as far as right in the middle of Africa, Asia and Europe. So they're right in the middle. And if you want to go, these trade routes that they built, if you wanted to go anywhere in the world, you would get on these amazing highways. Now, I'm not talking about our cars and stuff, right? But they had these amazing highways that, that went to all these different places. And Israel is positioned in the right place. Why did God chose, chose Israel 2,000 years before? I think some of it's just geography. It's the right place at the right time. And had it been happened any other time, this superhighway system wouldn't be here, and the apostles and the disciples wouldn't be able to go out into all the world and tell about Mary's son, Jesus. She's not just the perfect girl, it's the perfect time. Also, right before the Roman Empire, you have Alexander the Great, right? And one of the things he did is he went into all the known world, and he made uh, the Greek language, he made it a universal language. That even if you had your own language, everybody spoke Greek, right? And so in this perfect time, it looks like God's been silent for 400 years, but for 400 years, man, He was moving. He was getting all the whole known world to speak the same language. He was building a super highway system that the gospel would go out. Mary was the perfect girl at the perfect time. And let me tell you something about your life. You are the child of God, and you are the perfect person in the perfect time in history to accomplish something great in the kingdom of God. God didn't love Mary more than He loves you. In fact, in Mary's life, we know this as the Bible teaches us, Mary wasn't the greatest of any man ever born. It was John the Baptist. But anybody that gets saved, see, John the Baptist didn't have our salvation, right? Anybody in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. We don't realize what's inside of us. And guys, I, I say this, I guess, a lot, but I, I believe that we're at, we're at the end times. I believe we're really close to it. And the, and the biggest issue about the end times is the great harvest that's going to happen. So God has chosen you to be the perfect person at the perfect time. I mean, that superhighway system was nothing compared to what we can do now, right? Is any, you can get on a plane and go anywhere in the world. And then if you've got to drive up in the mountains, it won't take you. This summer we went into the mountains of of the Russian Caucasus to a village where there's no believers who've ever heard anything about Jesus. And it didn't take that long to get there. You are the perfect person in the perfect time to accomplish great things in Jesus' name. And, and we've got to get over this issue that we think having favor with God means it's all about me. I mean, that's really what we think if we're honest. Favor with God is all about how I feel about me. That's how we, that's how we judge favor with God, but that's not what God was dealing with with Mary. It wasn't about how she felt about herself. In fact, it was the opposite. It's not about how you feel and how you, how you interpret your circumstances. It's about what you receive is what God wants to do through you. God's not being silent. It may look like it sometimes, but He's working. He's moving. We call this, you know, we, we, we address this age of, of church history where God's not speaking, but that did not mean God wasn't moving. I'll confess it's in these times when we don't hear or see God accomplishing what we think He should that it becomes most difficult to trust Him. And that's just the reality of our fallen nature, right? It's, it's hardest to trust Him when we don't see with our eyes what we expected or, or want or what we think God should be doing. But if we back up and look, look at Mary's life, I go back to that one verse, there's no word of God that will ever fail. 
And what I find with most of us is we can believe that for one another, but we have a harder time believing it for ourselves. Like, I can believe it for you, but can I believe it for me? And you've got to start believing so that you can start moving. That you are the perfect person in the perfect time of history to accomplish great things in the kingdom of God. The favor of God is mixed with great promise, but great trials. We have believed the lie that Christianity is easy. And if it's not easy, there's something wrong with us. I want you to repeat this after me. Um, You can turn there if you want to. Psalms 136, verse 17. Psalms 136, 17. And to make it easy, since you're going to repeat after me, how about I say it and you repeat after the version that I'm reading so we're not saying a bunch of different versions. So I'll just give you a few words at a time. I'll ask you to close your eyes, if you will, so you, you can just repeat after me. How precious are your thoughts about me? Can we say that again? How precious are your thoughts about me, oh God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. All right, you can look up. Can you believe that for yourself? I don't, I don't say we need to believe it for ourselves so that we think we're great. I think we need to believe it for ourselves so we can do something great. We need to believe that God, I mean, God's, he's got the whole universe, right? But he, he looks down upon this planet. And he looks down upon Israel, this tiny little nation. And within Israel, he looks down in the, in the, in the Galilee region, which isn't Jerusalem. You know, it's not the, the holy city. And in the Galilee region, he looks down upon the tiniest little town with a few hundred people. And in that tiny little town, he picks out a 14 or 16 year old girl. And he tells Gabriel, who stands in his presence, says, Gabriel, I want you to go to her. I want you to go to Mary. And I want you to tell her that even though she's a virgin, she's going to have the Son of God. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to save the world from all their sins. Now, if God does that with Mary, and if God can see Mary like that, can He not see us? He sees you. He sees you. You're not forgotten. His thoughts about you can't be numbered. If we're going to celebrate Christmas, then let's celebrate the the work, not only the birth of Jesus, but the, the sacrifice and the risen Savior and what it means for us. What it means for you. To, to leave here and be discouraged, to, to not be moving forward, to not realize what God has for you, is to not celebrate the, the birth and sacrifice and the, the power of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. We've been saying, in the, in, so I, I am, I believe, the furthest you can be from a name it and claim it guy. But I believe we also need to believe. And I believe that God wants to do some amazing things in our lives this year. I believe that he's telling us through different words, through different people, through different signs, he's telling us that this coming year, his heart, his plan, is to fulfill great promises. Can you believe it? Can you grab a hold of it? Can you walk into it? Let's celebrate Jesus because of who he is and what he's done and what he's doing. Praise God he's not dead. 
my mama told me this morning. She called me early this morning and said, he's not dead, he's alive. And he's alive, and all that it means is that he's alive. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads? Just a couple of things. God sees you. God sees you. God's favor is on your life. And he is with you, just like Mary. We, we could have done a whole study on, on, on this phrase that he says over Mary. is the same phrase that, that Paul tells us about ourselves. That his favor is on you and that he's with you. So even though the favor may mean there's trials, he's with you in the midst of them. Like he was Mary. And the other thing is, even if it seems like he's silent, you can trust that he's working behind the scenes. He's working behind the scenes in your life. And he's got a plan. God, I thank you for your goodness over our life, Lord. Thank you that you are faithful, that you never give up, that you never leave us nor forsake us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of us. Your spirit. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I want to ask just, just for a moment this morning. How many of you feel like God's being silent in your life? I just want you to hold your hand up real quick. You feel like he's being silent in your life. Anybody else? You're not the only one. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. We could have our prayer team just gather at the back. Be ready to receive people. And I'm just going to ask you to be bold and be brave if you raised your hand. You can walk to the back and there will be some, some guys standing in the back that have some lanyards on so you can recognize them. And you just feel like God has maybe forgotten you or you feel like he's being silent. I just want you to go grab one of these guys and say, hey, I, this is how I feel. Can you pray for me? Would you mind praying for me? God, I just pray that you would quicken our spirits to believe, to trust, to obey, to walk into all that you have for us, Lord. God, these that have been bold enough to raise their hand and say, Lord, I feel like you're being silent. I don't want to feel this way anymore, and I, I want to trust that you are moving in my life. But not only that, I want to hear your voice. If there's anything in the way of me hearing your voice, Lord, would you just, would you just annihilate it? Would you just get rid of it? Would you just do something with it? Say these things in Jesus' name, amen.